Hello, if you're watching this video demo, that probably means that you're new to the Mightly Math app, or perhaps just getting started. I'm here today to walk you through the app itself, and to show you a few of the different systems and tools we've put in place to help organize the app and streamline it, and to show you how to best make use of those various systems and tools. So let's get started right away. I'm going to unlock my iPad, click into the app, and now we're met with the, the home login screen. So here right now, I have one profile. It's an example student, Marc Casinova. Um, but usually, if you have many different students uh, set up on the app, all of their profiles will appear here. So this is a great way to get an overview of the different students you have logged into one iPad. Um, so a classroom full of students will appear with their faces here, just as they would in real life. So I'm going to click on my example student. And now I'm brought to the home page. This is sort of the, the main HQ, you could call, of the app. Um, it's where you'll spend a lot of time. It's the category screen. So as you can see, as I scroll through, there are about 16 different mathematical categories that all of our math exercises are grouped into. Before I get into any of these categories, though, I just want to go over a brief overview of the app and the different organizational systems we have. Um, up top, on the top right, as you can see, we have a few different ways of organizing the app. Uh, those are those buttons in green up there. So for example, the knowledge map, very top right, is what I've clicked on to bring me here. Next to it is the catalog icon. If I click on it, I'm brought to a list of grades. This is a different way of organizing our exercises. Uh, it's organized by grade. So if I click, for example, on second grade, as you can see by my profile in the top left of the screen, my example student is eight years old in second grade. I can click here and see all of the different math units that the app deems appropriate for second graders. Of course, you can switch back and forth. Perhaps, it, perhaps if a student is more advanced or needs a little bit extra help, you can click into the first or third grade. Um, but this is a great way to sort of get a baseline uh, understanding of what units the app thinks is acceptable, or at least just appropriate for a student in a specific grade. Going back to those green buttons in the top right, if I click on suggestions up here, I get a list of teacher's picks just for me. Here's a little example of some of the tutorials we've built into the app to help the kids figure it out. But going back to these math units, um, I have gone on the teacher dashboard and assigned myself a few units. There will be a separate demo for the teacher dashboard that I highly encourage you to watch to get a holistic understanding of Mibly and how to use it. Um, but for now, we'll focus on the app itself. So I've gone on te the teacher's dashboard and I've picked a few different modules or units uh, to assign to myself. The way this works is a teacher goes on the dashboard, chooses units, or as we call them, modules, uh, assigns them to their students, and they show up here in the suggestions page on the app. That way, when a classroom full of students opens up their iPads and they all go to the suggestions page, they have the modules waiting right there for them without the need from the teacher to walk around from iPad to iPad and show the students exactly which suggested units to go to. They're right there for them. Finally, this search function on the top left, it's pretty self-explanatory. I can search up uh, lists uh, of modules. I can search up modules by name, by mathematical concept. But what's nice about this is that if I go to the search function and I say, let's say I want to work with fractions, then I have all sorts of different modules involving fractions. However, what's really um, useful about this search tool is that not all of these modules are in the fractions category. So if I go back to the knowledge map, fractions has its own category right here. However, if I go back and look up fractions, there are some modules in here that are not in the modules, uh, sorry, the fractions category. For example, word problems fractions on the top left, that's not in the fractions category, that's in the word problems uh, category. So this is a great way of making sure you can find all of the different modules that contain a certain mathematical unit without having to go into each category and combing over them and making sure that you haven't missed a module that contains, say, fractions, if you're interested in working with fractions. So let's go back to the main page. And before I get into these categories and show you how to actually do the math exercises, I want to show you the menu on the top left. There are a few different pages in here that are pretty useful. Mibly Achievements, I'll show you in a bit. Teacher's Panel, I'm about to show you. But I'll start with the top left right here with My Info. 
because this is what the screen looks like when you first create a profile. So when a student first logs onto an iPad and you want to create their profile for the first time, they're asked to fill in all this information. Now I've put in a photo from the internet, a name, a class, an age, and a gender. The things that are most useful are the photo, the name, and the grade. Age, gender, class identifier, those things are all optional. I'll go over the class identifier in a second and explain what that is. But the photo is extremely helpful for a few reasons. One, when you first log into an iPad, there are going to be a lot of different profiles, as I explained, if it's a classroom full of students. And being able to choose a face out of a crowd might be a little bit easier and quicker than a list of names, especially if you have multiple students who have the same name. So let's say you log onto an iPad, there are three Mac, for example, three boys with the same name as this one. It's going to be a little tricky to sort of pick out which is which without a photo. So I would highly recommend asking your students right there on their iPads to take a selfie and pop it into their photo profile right away. Their name, obviously, um, is helpful because it will identify them just like the photo. Uh, only first name is necessary. I've put in the last name here just as an example, but that's not particularly required. Uh, the grade is very helpful, both for your purposes, so you can keep track of who's in which grade if you have multiple classes of students in different grades, and also so that the app knows how to suggest different uh, modules and it knows which learning level, roughly, the student is at. The age and gender are more for your purposes than for the apps, just to help keep track of the students, but you can feel free to fill them in or not. It's up to you. And then the class identifier is helpful for school systems. Um, once you are set up with Mively in your school, you will have a class identifier that you can use uh, and type in here so that all of your different, diff uh, different classes can have their own sort of set of students and the Mively app will know how to organize your students based on which class they are because you'll be given a unique class identifier for each class uh, that you have connected to Mively. So that's where you would plug that in. That also has to do with the teacher dashboard, again, which is a separate demo that I would highly recommend you watch. Uh, I'll go over further there how to sort of use the class identifier to better organize your students. So let's go back to the menu here. Change profile is simple. If perhaps a student has logged into the wrong profile or if multiple students are sharing an iPad, that's a way to change the profile from one to another. Um, the pink square is another way to use the different uh, organizational structures that we have uh, that I went over earlier. The achievements, again, I'll go over that in a bit. Mybly Campus, you don't need to worry about that for the moment. Um, that'll be explained at a later time. For now, the one thing that I really want to focus on is the teacher's panel, which requires a quick math question to get into. Uh, in here, really the only thing that you need to know much about right now is settings. And then in settings, there are two things in particular that are pretty helpful to know. One is the language. If you have a multilingual classroom, switching between languages is super easy here. Once I exit out, everything will be in French. And then the music. Um, I'll log back out and back in so you can see it in English. Uh, the music button is pretty helpful. This is because if you have, let's say, an iPad or a classroom full of 12 iPads, all of these students are you know, using these iPads with their volume all the way up. There is some ambient music going on in the background. I've turned my volume off for the sake of not having to talk over the iPad. Um, but normally there would be some ambient music playing in the background. And if you have all of that music playing all at once on 12 different iPads, it might cause a bit of a headache. So you can come in here, turn off the music, and then it will be shut off on that iPad until somebody else comes ahead and changes it, which hopefully will only be you. Um, so let's go back here to the front page, to the categories. Um, again, like I just mentioned, the volume is off on my iPad, uh, just for the sake of me not needing to talk over uh, the different pieces of audio, but I will be explaining when audio is playing, playing um, and its purpose, so don't feel like you need to sort of guess when there's going to be audio. I'll help explain when it will be playing. So let's go to geometry. So once we're inside a category, it's organized like this. The modules are organized like this. And the way that they're positioned and organized is the same for every category. It starts with the most simple, with the easiest module. And as you go down, it gets more and more complicated, more difficult. So we start in geometry, for example, with recognizing geometrical shapes. 
And then as we go down, it gets more complicated. So you're not just recognizing squares and circles, but now you're recognizing, say, solid shapes, 3D objects. You're recognizing symmetrical lines on the left. You're recognizing circles on the right. And then as we go down, we're working with more and more complex and advanced concepts, such as points and line segments, angles, the angles of a triangle. Um, as you can see, there are multiple circles modules. Um, these are organized by difficulty. So as you can see in the bottom right of the little icon on the circles module, there are dots. Uh, the one on top right here has two. The one on the bottom has three. The one up here has one. Um, think of those as levels. This is a level one of circles. It's an introduction to different concepts like radius and circumference. Uh, but as we go down, you'll be working with more and more advanced concepts still dealing with circles. So let's start up here with recognizing parallel lines. Um, actually, before we go into the module itself, I just want to explain the color coding real quick. There's always going to be a key up here in case you forget this, um, but I'll go through it now. So if a module is listed as light orange, if you see this pale orange, as a lot of these modules are, that means that it's a module that the student hasn't opened up yet and hasn't started doing exercises with and is not really considered appropriate or um, sort of right on the point of where the student is supposed to be based on their grade. So for example, right here, recognizing geometrical shapes is pale orange because it's probably a little easy for a second grader. By the time that most students get to second grade, they can recognize and differentiate between circles, squares, triangles, etc. Whereas down here, uh, level three of circles, angles of a triangle, those are all modules that are pale orange because they're a tad bit advanced for a second grader. Um, you want to sort of introduce these concepts perhaps later on in a student's education unless they're really advanced. Now, that doesn't mean that a student can't try out these exercises. They can't go into these modules and look at them. This is up to your discretion. If you think that a student is ready to learn about lines, line segments, and rays, um, but the app thinks that it's a little advanced for them, there's nothing holding you back from going ahead and assigning that to that student using the teacher dashboard and putting it into their suggested, suggested modules. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. This is sort of just the app's baseline assumptions about a student's level based on their grade. The dark orange means that the module hasn't been started, but it is perfect for their grade level. So MyBly app recognizes that polygons are a great uh, concept to introduce to second graders. That's why it's dark orange. So it's recognizing shapes. So that's 3D and 2D shapes. Then you'll see some blue modules. There are none yet on this screen, um, but we'll see them in a minute after I start doing exercises. Light blue means that a student has started a module, uh, but has not completed it. And dark blue means that a student has totally gone through and completed a module. Uh, and I'll show you what that might look like, or at least partially completing a module might look like uh, right now. And we will do that in recognizing parallel lines. So I'm gonna click, go in, and right now, it might look like a blank screen with nothing going on. There is audio playing. Um, it is a lesson sort of on how to work with parallel lines, what parallel lines are. Um, so we'll let that play for a bit. I'll show you what it looks like when a lesson's going. And then I'll move on to exercise one. So I've clicked on this little one tab on the top of the screen and I've moved on to the actual exercise. So to explain those icons on the top of the screen, the little colored squares, the books represent lessons. These are 30 to 60 second bytes of information that are given to present a concept, introduce a student to a new mathematical notion, um, and they require no interactivity. They're just there for the student to watch. Um, there are anywhere between one and six lessons per module. Um, depending on how many new concepts are introduced within that module. Then these numbers one through six, those are the actual exercises. These are the engaging and interactive parts uh, of the actual modules themselves. Not to say that the lessons aren't engaging, but this is where the students get to really go hands on with these new concepts. Um, every single module has six exercises, no exceptions. In addition, they're all organized similarly to how categories are organized in the sense that from one to six, the exercises get more and more complex, more difficult. One other thing to note is that after every lesson, after every book icon, the numbers that follow it deal with the concepts presented in that lesson, no more, no less. So for example, right here in this book, we are introduced to parallel and perpendicular lines or intersecting lines. Then that means that exercises one through six will work with the concepts presented in that lesson 
and nothing else will be introduced. They'll just get more and more complex, but working with the same ideas. Just going out real quick before I start exercises, I just want to show you a different comparison. So let's say we go to geometric symbols. Here you can see that there are a bunch of different lessons. So there's one lesson up here, then exercise one. Then there's a new lesson, and then exercise two deals with the concepts presented in lesson one and lesson two. So it's cumulative. None of the exercises that happen before a book uh, icon or a lesson uh, will deal with concepts presented in that later lesson. So that's a good way to sort of let you know uh, how a student should sort of organize their viewing of the lessons and then filling of the exercises. Um, however, you can skip around between exercises. There's nothing preventing a student from going from one to three to five. Perhaps if you see that a student is really advanced and they've gotten a concept down very quickly, you can tell them do one and two and then go ahead and jump to four, five, six. Um, there's nothing holding you back from suggesting that to your students. However, I would recommend getting your students to watch the lessons that come between exercises. So let's say, for example, in symmetrical lines over here, if a student is doing really well on exercise one, you can tell them to skip ahead to three, but I would recommend getting them to watch the lesson that comes before four before telling them to go ahead and do exercise four. So going back to recognizing parallel lines, going to one, uh, at the start of every exercise, there is audio that plays that sort of explains what the point of the exercise is, how to complete it. Um, right now, the audio is telling me to observe the lines and choose whether they are par parallel or intersecting and click my answer. Um, this little orange icon, the speaker icon on the right, if I click that, that gives me the option to repeat the instructions. Um, so if I miss the instructions, if I didn't hear them, if I need to hear them again, that option is always available to click on that. I'll go over those buttons on the right in a second, what the other non-highlighted ones do. Um, but for now, I'll go over the actual exercise itself. So I'm presented with these two lines, and I'm given the choice to see if they're parallel or intersecting. And the great part about digital education, and about my blue math specifically, is that it allows us to do so many things that we couldn't do with a pencil and paper. So if I was given this exercise on traditional pen and paper, I would look at these lines, circle my answer, and move on. But here, I can use my finger and actually move the lines around and see if they're parallel or intersecting. And once they're together, they're highlighted to show that they're the same line when they're put together. And so when they're separated, they're parallel. So I select my answer and I move on. Different question. Now they're intersecting. I can move them around and the app actually highlights the point of intersection. Very helpful for visualizing and for sort of <clears throat> getting a hands-on uh, experience working with this new mathematical concept. So I choose that they're intersecting and I move on. As you can see on that tab, the one tab on the top of the screen, there's a little green bar that's filling up as I complete these exercises. That green bar fills up with correct answers, so incorrect answers will not contribute to the filling up of that bar. Um, and once it's filled up, I get little prizes and rewards for finishing the exercise. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Um, there are different amounts of Sorry, there are different amounts of correct answers required to fill up that bar depending on how complicated the exercise is. So if the exercise is a multi-step problem, let's say it's a geometry problem that involves a few rounds of calculation, it might only ask you for four or five correct answers before you fill up that bar. But for something like this, where it's pretty easy to look at the lines, click your answer and keep moving within a few seconds, it'll ask you for more like seven or eight. So I'm going to keep on doing these problems, filling up the bar. In the meantime, let me explain the buttons on the right. Um, that button up top, that's a timer. Um, that's there for timed exercises. So for example, multiplication tables. Um, since a student should, in theory, know multiplication tables by heart, um, they should be able to recite them in a certain amount of time. So that's where the timer comes in. We don't like to time a ton of exercises because we recognize that timing exercises might cause pressure for students. But again, for things like multiplication tables, sometimes a timer is pretty helpful to get them to sort of memorize them uh, to the point where it's reflexive to, to recite them. Um, also, some exercises in mental math, for example, will ask you to use the timer so that you can make sure that you're doing mental math in, a, in an efficient manner. Um, below the timer icon, there's an eraser. Uh, many problems, I'll show you one later, ask you to write out your answers. There's a handwriting recognition technology built into this app. Um, but if you write the wrong answer 
or maybe if you use your your messy second grader handwriting to write in an answer you need to erase it that's what that button is for again the speaker is for repeating instructions below that is a calculator not many exercises will ask you to use a calculator but some of them maybe if the calculation isn't the point of the exercise again say a geometry question where some calculation is required but the point of the exercise isn't to improve calculation skills um, that's where the calculator will come in below that is uh, if a question requires maybe a table to be filled out or a graph or some sort of uh, pre-existing structure um, that's where a blank one will be so if I have a unit conversion table for example I can click on that button and have a blank unit conversion table to fill out and work with and then at the very bottom that pencil icon uh, that's scratch paper or extra working space um, if a problem requires a lot of sort of working and a lot of visualizing your your work that's a uh, space that will become available that button will be clickable when you get to those exercises um, so going back to the exercise itself as you can see I've mostly filled up the bar I'm about to fill it up and show you what it looks like when you finish an exercise our little mascot comes up iron puzzle pieces and a badge and I fill out my score so this is a lot of different systems coming into place at once and I'll take a pause in the exercises to show you how this works so let's go back to the home page I get a little stamp for completing an exercise today I go to the menu and now I can see I have a few icons in the my Blue math achievement section so these achievements are little rewards that you get like you just saw from completing exercises um, they're sort of incentives for the students to get excited about math um, sort of real tangible rewards that they get from math because as nice as it is to get a student working on math and to get them doing exercises just for the sake of being better at math sometimes they need a little colorful reward to act as the carrot at the end of the stick and get them to keep going um, it's exciting for these kids to win different rewards and I'll show you how they can sort of apply them in different spaces I'll go from left to right in this achievements uh, section so on the left little calendar that tracks what days of the week and how long I've spent on each day uh, on my blue math I can tap on the step itself and it'll tell me what exercises I did what modules I worked in oops excuse me as you can see it's pretty quick to load back into the app if you accidentally click out like I just did um, you can go into the trophy room here I can keep learning to win trophies which means that as I complete a lot of different exercises um, I can earn trophies so if I complete a whole module or a set of modules uh, I win different exercises uh, I win different trophies that appear here the badges here uh, I earn by doing different exercises uh, or perhaps different achievements uh, these are a little bit like Boy Scout badges or perhaps achievements in video games so for example I just earned this one for completing my first level my first set of exercises in Mibly some of them are pretty tough and they require a lot of work uh, this one over here for example requires you to do Mibly math five days in a row five times so that's a nice one that you get for some consistency um, and then some of them are you know silly little ones that are fun for the kids but don't really reflect a lot of math achievement they're more just there for I guess a fun little reward so this one, for example, you get for completing uh, an exercise on Halloween. Going back to the achievements, the next one from the badges is the puzzle pieces. This one's my favorite. Um, it's a really sweet way of sort of applying uh, the different rewards and points that you win in a fun, creative way. So you see all of these photos are grayed out, but a student can choose a photo that they want to start filling out. Let's say I'm feeling hungry today, so I look at the photo of the candy over here I can take my puzzle piece that I've earned pop it into the photo and then as I keep going it'll slowly start to fill in as colors and then as a student keeps on working with the app they can see all of these different black and white photos slowly start to transform into colored photos it's a great way for the student to sort of see their progress and also choose the photos that you know they find the most interesting personalize their experience a bit it's really sweet um, you can see in here that there are golden puzzle pieces required um, so on the top right it keeps a tally of how many puzzle pieces and how many golden puzzle pieces I have um, golden puzzle pieces you earn for completing uh, the levels 
five and six or the exercises five and six within a module, um, getting them 100%. Uh, I think level four as well, but I'm not sure. But it's basically a reward for completing the most difficult exercises within a module. And they work differently. You can't complete a puzzle until you've earned the golden puzzle pieces required to fit them in. Um, so it's a nice incentive to really challenge yourself and complete uh, modules all the way through. Then past the puzzle pieces, we have this points meter. Um, it's this little meter that fills up with points. The more I work, um, I've just completed my first exercise. So my bar is pretty much empty, but it fills up as I go along. And it's a nice way of sort of tracking progress long term, um, seeing how you fill up these bars with points. As you can see, it requires a couple thousand points per bar. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty long term process, but it's nice for a student to sort of click on this maybe a few months into using Mively and look back on their progress. Finally, you get a free gift each day that you log on. I'll choose my gift. Mm, I'll go for the one on the right. I'm feeling lucky today. Sweet. I want a puzzle piece. Sometimes those are empty. Um, it's just a game of chance. But don't worry. The more your students log on, the more gifts they'll get. So that's a nice little incentive for them to keep logging on. So if I go back into my profile and I keep going, I'm going to show you another uh, exercise that highlights some of the different uh, systems that we've built into this app to make it a better educational tool. So that's going to be in numbers. As you can see, again, some of these exercises are highlighted in dark orange to show that they're acceptable and sort of appropriate for kids my age, uh, being eight years old. But I'm going to go to one that isn't dark orange. Um, again, totally acceptable. And I'm going to go to discovering negative numbers with a thermometer. So this is for students who have not really yet encountered negative numbers and are being introduced to the concept. So right now there's a lesson playing. It's introducing thermometers. Um, and I'm going to use this uh, module to show you an example of two really important systems that we've sort of baked into the app. And that's dynamic corrections and the Singapore math method. So the Singapore math method is a way of teaching math that, as the name implied, was developed in Singapore in the 80s. Um, it's also known as the CRA method, or the Concrete Representational Abstract Method, and it's incredibly helpful for introducing new mathematical concepts to students, and it's a big part of this app. Um, so Concrete Representational Abstract is sort of a good overview of how the Singapore method works, because you start with a concrete representation of a new mathematical concept, in this case, negative numbers, uh, you move on to the representational, so that's using a thermometer to represent uh, these different numbers. Um, a student has seen a thermometer before, they've likely worked with a thermometer at some point, maybe at home, or they've just seen one around. Uh, and then you move on to the abstract, you sort of transition a student to the abstract, which is working with sort of pure numbers and not needing, needing to rely on that concrete uh, image or object to represent those concepts. So we start off with this concrete object, this thermometer, we've gone on to this exercise, we now get a reading on the thermometer, and we're asked to draw in the reading. So right now it's negative 15. I'm going to write in my answer, negative 15. Reads it correctly, perfect, I move on. Let's say I'm, you know, a second grader, my handwriting's a little messy, I want to write a negative 20, but, you know, I slip up a little bit, app doesn't recognize my handwriting, I can click the eraser and start again. Perfect. And now as I keep going, I'll show you what I mean by dynamic corrections. So in the app, every single module, or at least most modules, have different corrections built in place to show students what they got wrong based on their specific errors. So what I mean by that is that two different types of errors in a problem will result in two different corrections from the app. So let's say, for example, here, that I see the thermometer, I read the negative five degrees, but perhaps my vision's a little off, or I, I'm you know, careless and I read it poorly, and I write in, let's say, negative 15. The app doesn't accept my answer, it says it's wrong, so right here it's highlighting that negative five line, it's erasing my answer, writing in the new one, and again, that negative five increment is highlighted to show me what I did wrong. Just need to reread the line, pretty simple concept. Now I'm gonna make a different error. I see that negative 10, I see that the bar is there, but let's say I haven't quite gotten the grasp of negative numbers down yet perfectly, 
I'm going to write in 10 degrees Celsius. Now the app recognizes that my issue isn't that I've misread the line, but that I haven't fully grasped the idea of negative numbers yet. So now it's highlighting for me, the audio is telling me that the numbers in blue are negative and red are positive. And so I need to measure down to the negative 10. Erase my answer and write it in with a negative sign. So that's dynamic correction. Many, many, many modules will have dynamic correction in them, um, but not all because some modules, there is a pretty black or white, black or white, right or wrong answer. And there are a few ways to get them wrong. Um, multiplication tables, for example, doesn't really need dynamic correction because either a student gets the answer right or they don't. Um, that first exercise that I showed you with the parallel lines where I select parallel or intersecting, that doesn't really have dynamic correction as well either because again, there's one right answer, one wrong one. Um, but for more open-ended questions like this, there will almost always be dynamic correction in place. This is incredibly helpful and lets you sort of get by on letting the app do a bit of your job for you uh, in the sense that if a student gets a question wrong, you don't need to run around from iPad to iPad, student to student, and show them exactly what they did wrong and how to fix their error. The app is there to do that for them. So I'll move on. There's a new lesson. And now exercise two. So what's changed between the first exercise and the next exercise? So I filled up my 10 degrees Celsius, my 15. And now I can see where the exercises are different. So in that lesson that we just skipped over, it showed us how to read the increments in between multiples of five. So now in lesson two, we're working with a slightly new idea. It's how to read a thermometer when the bar isn't on the multiples of five that you can read and are spelled out in numbers. Now I have to actually count the lines in between and do the work myself. Then there's a new lesson and a new exercise. Now I have to read negative numbers with the increments between uh, multiples of five. And as you can see, the lower limit has been extended down to 30. So I'm working with a few, or the range of negative numbers rather, that I'm working with has gotten wider. Um, but again, as you can see, I'm sort of still on that uh, thermometer representation. I'm still in the sort of concrete and representational phase of concrete representational abstract. Lesson four, I move on. Now, exactly the same concepts. I'm not working with any new ideas, but it's sort of the inverse way of working with them. I'm, I'm given a number. And now I have to slide this little marker down to match it. Increments of one rather than five to make it a bit more complicated. But again, I'm still on that concrete sort of aspect of things. I haven't moved on to abstract. I'm a student who's been introduced to negative numbers. I'm pretty comfortable with the thermometer right now, but I'm not quite ready to move on to negative numbers as an abstract concept. And that's where this next lesson comes in. So let me show you what that looks like, the transition from rep representational to abstract. Temperatures between 0 and minus 30 degrees are negative temperatures, whereas temperatures between 0 and 10 degrees are positive temperatures. Now, let's look at this together. These numbers are called negative numbers. These numbers are called positive numbers. Drag the number to the right place. Now, as a student, I'm ready to work with negative numbers on a number line, which is a much more abstract concept. As time goes on, there will be more and more questions that involve asking a student to work with negative numbers that are now completely abstract because a student has gone through this Singapore math method of starting out with a very concrete um, image or object and using it as sort of a guide to transition students into abstract versions of that same concept. Um, this is a really great way of teaching students math. It's an enormous advantage of using Mibly Math or any digital learning tool, but especially Mibly Math, because we have such a strong emphasis on Singapore math and on using this sort of uh, visual and dynamic way of introducing concepts to students um, that you can't find in really any other format, especially a traditional pen and paper format. Of course, I'm not dishing on pen and paper. Um, it can be very helpful for doing rote exercises and drills, um, but you can't introduce mathematical concepts or work with them in such a hands-on way uh, in the same way as you can on this app. So that's why this is super helpful. So now I'm on to negative numbers as an abstract concept. I can move on to number six. You can see there's a timer up top. I've started it. I take these numbers and I sort them into positive, 
and negative, and it's pretty much completely abstract by now. Um, the little buckets are sort of visual aids, but I'm really just looking at a number and determining whether it's positive or negative without the help of sort of a, a thermometer metaphor or anything like that. Um, and that's the beauty of, of sort of Singapore math and how we've organized it and baked it into the app. Um, a few more quick things I want to show you. Uh, one is that within the category page on the top right, you can reorganize them. Um, excuse me. Uh, you can reorganize them by alphabetical order. Um, the ones that you've already opened up and the ones that are appropriate for the student or the ones in dark orange will appear at the top for convenience. If you click on the module, you can watch a demo, start it, look at your progress on it. Um, and then this light bulb is right here. Um, it's the suggested uh, modules within that category. If your teacher or if a student's teacher has suggested a module for them um, that is within the category, it'll appear here. And then if not, the app will suggest one that it deems appropriate for a student of your level. Um, something that's really nice about the app is that as time goes on and as a student keeps on working with the app, uh, the artificial intelligence in the app will determine what their math level is more precisely than just their grade. Um, so that as time goes on, let's say I'm in this category and I'm looking for uh, an exercise to work with and perhaps the teacher says find an exercise on your own or work with it at home, I can click on this light bulb and the app will actually suggest a uh, module to me that's pretty tailor-made to my specific strengths and weaknesses in math. So that's super nice. The, the, the artificial intelligence that sort of looks at a student's strengths and weaknesses is pretty robust. Um, it's not just rate of success, it's does a student work well with abstract concepts, with visual concepts, with quick math versus you know structured longer word problems. Um, so it's a really nice way of sort of allowing the student to, to get personalized suggestions. So that's what that little light bulb is for within the category. Um, and then finally, I just want to show you really quickly sort of another way that the app is super hands-on and helpful for introducing concepts. So let's go to tables and graphs. I'll reorganize it by difficulty. So you can see that some of these exercises are dark orange because they're nice for students in my grade level, but I want to go to starting graphs. So there's a lesson introducing graphs. And then here I'm given uh, a little bar chart to sort of start me off um, on the idea of graphs, start off sort of the journey of graphs. Um, and the audio instructions that you can't hear have told me to create a bar chart where uh, it represents a certain amount of one house and a certain amount of the other. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I won't be submitting my answer. But just to show you one more time how this interactivity is really helpful for a student and why you should really rely on Lively to introduce mathematical concepts. If I were given the same uh, instruction with a pen and paper, I would have to draw out a graph, which is tedious in the first place. Um, and then I would have to draw out the bars on the bar graph. And if I get it wrong, or if I want to change it, or if I want to see how it looks differently, I have to erase and redraw. But here, I can take my fingers, and I can slide the bars up and down. So for example, if I restart the, the exercise, I'm given a certain amount of mice and birds to put on the graph. And actually use my finger like I just did and slide the bars up and down right um, in the next few exercises I can do the same thing I'm asked for a certain number of boys and girls on the graph I can slide the bars up and down and this is a much more interactive and engaging way of working with the new concept um, the last one here I like uh, it's say uh, the instructions are you know make a pie chart where the majority of fruits are cherries Rather than having to draw out a pie chart and then draw in static lines that I can't change, I can visualize exactly what it looks like as I increase the proportions of different fruits on this pie chart. And it's a much more interactive way of working with new concepts. Um, so I highly encourage you when considering how to introduce a mathematical concept to your students, use Mibly Math. Um, I'm not suggesting that you completely replace paper and pen entirely, um, but this is a really great way to sort of introduce mathematical concepts and then keep working on them as more and more advanced versions of themselves. So I can start out graphs here, I can work with it on Mibly Math, I can supplement it with in-class learning, and then as the years go on, I can still use Mibly Math all these years later so that when I go down to, say, draw a graph, it's a much more complicated way of looking at the same concept that I learned uh, way, way, way earlier up here, um, and it's gonna be a lot easier for me because it's really dynamic and it's still using that same level of 
um, interactivity. So for example, here I can look at the pie chart, I can uh, adjust the different bars, I'll wait for the audio to finish so I can start adjusting the bars. Right, like that. Um, and in that way, it's a really interactive way of working with pretty advanced mathematical concepts, at least at an elementary school level. So I'll leave you with one suggestion uh, at the end of this demo, and it's do your homework a little bit with the app. Um, there are a lot of different modules and exercises within them, and nobody expects you to go through and memorize every single module and exercise. I've been working with this app for a while, and I don't know where every module is within the categories, um, but it's really helpful to sort of know uh, what you'll be working with in advance for a day. Um, and what I mean by that is if I'm going uh, into, let's say, fractions, and I want to teach my older students about, uh, let's say, addition and subtraction of fractions, or uh, adding and subtracting mixed numbers, I might work with negative numbers in those exercises, and I don't know it yet until I've gone in and looked and seen, okay, so here's some exercises that are dealing with negative numbers as well as fractions. And that way I know that I want to make sure that I've presented negative numbers to my students and they know how to work with negative numbers before I go into the fractions and all of a sudden they're surprised with a new mathematical concept like fractions, but then in addition, another one that they're unfamiliar with like negative numbers. So that's my suggestion. Um, a day or two in advance before a class, just go into the modules that you're planning on assigning to your students, go into them, making sure that they've covered all the concepts that are already presented in there. Um, and then just get a feel for the exercises. Uh, there are so many different kinds of exercises on this app. I've shown you three main examples and they're all pretty different, um, but there are dozens and dozens of different ways that these exercises can be structured. So I'd highly, re highly recommend going in yourself, uh, making sure you understand how they work, playing with the app a little bit, and sort of just feeling confident. Um, it is an app built for kids, so there's nothing on this app that you can't figure out on your own. Um, but I would highly, highly recommend going in and working with it yourself. Um, if at any point you do have a question or an issue, if you have something that you'd like to bring up about organization or an exercise in particular, I would highly encourage you to go into the menu, go into the teacher's panel, get the math question right. I always get a little nervous at this part in demonstrations. Uh, my math skills are sharpened, I'd like to think, but it's a little embarrassing to get that question wrong to get into the teacher panel. Um, and then contact us with this button right here and it'll send you straight to an email uh, to our help uh, center. And we highly encourage you to do so if you experience any questions or issues that you come across, um, we're here to help. So that's about it. That's all I need to know. That's all you need to know, excuse me, about Mibly Math before getting started on your own. Um, again, reach out if you have any questions, but I wish you the best of luck starting out with your class, working with it with yourself, with your students. Um, and I'm very happy that you've decided to sort of join the Mibly Math family. Um, we've seen great success uh, improving students' math skills, and hopefully you do too. Um, it's a fun app. Your students will love it. And again, best of luck. Thank you for choosing Mibly Math.